Good morning and welcome to Clemens Moravian Church on this third Sunday after Pentecost in here in uh, Clemens, North Carolina. If you're visiting with us for the very first time, either virtually or in person, a hearty welcome to you. We thank you for spending this time with us today. We hope that your time with us will be blessed. We have lots happening in our church family, even though it's summer and people are taking vacations, still things happening at the church. So please look through your bulletins and see those activities that you might like to join in and let us know. Just contact the church office and we will put you together with uh, whatever activity or ministry is happening this summer. I want to begin our time going to the Lord in prayer. So will you pray with me? Let us pray. Lord, today we recall your faithfulness. Thank you that you walk with us each and every day, that you are with us always. We proclaim that your promises are true and your goodness and love never fail. In this moment, we come to you and lay our lives before you. May we honor, worship, and adore you with every fiber of our being. Father, we proclaim that you are the Holy One, the Lord God Almighty, who has come into our midst. Your beauty and majesty are beyond compare. On this day, we join with all those who worship and confess you as Lord from generations past and present and with all the angels that sing in heaven of your greatness and splendor. Lord, we adore you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we bow down and worship you. Amen. Today is a special day. We have um, time this morning to celebrate our vacation Bible school and in a minute we're going to get to hear some songs and see a little bit about what uh, took place over the last few days here in the sanctuary of the church but before we do I want to give some thanks to some people that really made this happen uh, brother Randy Fulton Maggie Harper Charlotte Thor Becky Cook and Paul Stutzman Rebecca Matthews Robert Tuttle and Suzanne Mann, all, uh, and there are more that helped with Vacation Bible School, but each and every one of these uh, put their heart and time into this. Can we give those folks a hand? We had a wonderful uh, time this week, uh, and we had about 15 uh, children that participated Friday and Saturday evenings for our Vacation Bible School. Our theme was on earth as it is in heaven. We learned the Lord's Prayer and uh, several of these songs. Uh, Pastor Chris, while we're here, we have a warm-up song for you. And, uh, oh, don't go too far. Because today's his birthday. So we're gonna get our, everybody join in together. We did sing, uh, we did sing this, uh, these songs. Jesus taught us how to pray to the tune of Jesus Loves Me. Jesus taught us how to pray to God our Father. Yes, we can pray. Yes, we can pray. Yes, we can pray to God throughout the day. We're going to do this next one. It has the uh, verse, every color, every race, all are covered by His grace. We're going to do what we did three times. The second time we're going to do it really quiet. Okay, ready? Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every color, every race, all are covered by His grace. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every color, every 
every race, we are covered by His grace. Jesus loves the little children of the world. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Every color, every race, all are covered by His grace. Jesus loves the little children of the world. This was our theme song. Our Father in heaven, our Father in heaven, how awesome is your name? How awesome is your name? As we are um, inviting you to take a seat, I have just a two-minute uh, video that we're going to watch when they're all done uh, so they can see. This is some of what we did, our games, crafts, our meals. Um, and again, thank you to everyone who helped out. We had a wonderful time. Thank you for bringing your children here. Uh, we we're glad to have uh, members and visitors and welcome. You're always uh, welcome to be a part of our church throughout the year. So let's watch a few of the highlights from this week. Our Father in
Amen. We are um, continuing our worship service with our prayers for our uh, education found on page 127. I invite you to stand as we pray this together. We will be praying the Lord's Prayer in just a few minutes as we uh, pray this together. So let us rise and pray. We praise you, Lord. We give thanks to you with our whole heart. The works of your hands are faithful and just. Our reverence for you is the beginning of wisdom. every good and perfect gift, we praise you for the wisdom, power, and love displayed in the natural universe and in humanity, whom you have placed within it to care for it and nurture it. Light of the world, we praise you for being eternal truth. Revealer of the deep things of God, we praise you for your gifts of awe and wonder, which lead us on the path of true wisdom. you to be seated as we pray. God of vision and wisdom, we confess our short-sightedness and folly in our search for knowledge and understanding, for our pride in pursuing and using knowledge in ways that make us think we are superior to others. We ask your forgiveness. For our failure to ask hard questions and our willingness to be satisfied with easy answers, for our ignorance of history and tradition, and for our stubborn resistance to new insights of both heart and mind, we ask your forgiveness. Although your guidance is always available, we have relied upon our own will. Gracious God, you forgive us through Jesus Christ. In humble acknowledgement of your love revealed in him, we give you thanks and pray the prayer he taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, 
and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. commend all who learn, infants tasting and touching, children exploring and play, youth testing and challenging, and adults continuing the quest. In the disciplined mastery of subject and skill, in the reflection on life experience, in the practical wisdom of long years. at every age and in every circumstance of life. Bless our Lord and Give patience and understanding to those who teach. Give perseverance and openness of heart and mind to those who learn. Bless our Lord and Spirit of truth, to you we commend all the educational ministries of the church. Guide us in the search of the scriptures in the study of creation and in the pursuit of truth. Give to parents your wisdom and thoughts that with love and understanding they may guide to Christian maturity the young lives entrusted to their care. May congregations nurture faith in children, youth, and adults. Bless all those responsible for education in our community and country, teachers and administrators, custodians and clerks, students and families, for their gifts and their service. We give for all the diversity of human study and knowledge, for science and art, for literature and drama, for labor and play, for all the teaching experiences of life. We give Let us stand.
to the God of lasting wisdom, to the God of relentless change, to God be glory, majesty, dominion, and power. Amen. Amen. Please be seated. As we come to this time of personal reflection, we think about the acts of stewardship. We witnessed in real time this morning uh, the seeds of stewardship with young people. We come to this hopefully with a sense of joy in our hearts. And we, we think about how we might be a part of God's ongoing kingdom. So let us prepare our hearts as the choir leads us in meditation and the ushers come forward for our morning offering. God, what a great challenge you have given your children in allowing us to discern the priorities in our lives. Lord, as we bring these gifts and these offerings, as we think about our time, our talent, and our treasure, help us to choose you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. The children that are here today, we invite you to go to uh, Children's Church now with Randy as he's uh, leading that. And as we turn our focus to uh, God's Word, our first scripture this morning is Galatians 5, verses 13 through 25. For you were called to freedom, brothers and sisters. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for self-indulgence, but through love 
become slaves to one another. For the whole law is summed up in a single command. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. If, however, you bite and devour one another, take care that you are not consumed by one another. Live by the Spirit, I say, and do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the Spirit, and what the Spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For those are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmities, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissension, factions, envy, drunkenness, carousing, and things like these. I am warning you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, competing against one another, envying one another. Uh, Let us rise in body or spirit as we hear the reading of the gospel from Luke chapter 9, verses 51 through 62. When the days drew near for him to be taken up, Jesus set his face to go to Jerusalem, and he sent messengers ahead of him. On their way, they entered the village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. But they did not receive him because his face was set toward Jerusalem. When his disciples James and John saw it, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But Jesus turned and rebuked them. They went on to another village. As they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. To another he said, follow me, but he said, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. But Jesus said to him, let the dead bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Jesus said, No one who puts a hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come to you in this moment, in this time, in this place. And Lord, we pray for your spirit to open our hearts and our minds that we may hear, that we may see, that we may do your will. Allow us to hear the the joy of the gospel and allow our lives to be transformed by its every word. In Jesus' name, amen. Years ago, and I do mean years ago, I was getting ready to play in a state racquetball tournament, and I was trying to get prepared several months ahead, and I decided I was going to try to do some cross-training, and so I enrolled in a judo class. I thought this might be the way to give me a, a, a more complete workout and build up my stamina to be prepared for several days of tournament play. After several classes on basic physical conditioning, where we heard the mantra, no pain, no gain, 
our instructor then turned his teaching towards the self-defense part of the class, and he began to let us spar with each other. On one particular evening, we, uh, we were there, and we were beginning to choose our partners to spar, and our instructor uh, pulled me aside. I, I was one of the taller guys in the class, and he asked me to uh, just stand up against the wall. He wanted to demonstrate an elevated sidekick. Now, one thing I should tell you is that when we were doing our sparring in this class, we never actually made contact with each other. What we did is we would make these motions toward different places on the body, and then you were scored based on what that punch or chop or whatever would do if it actually made contact. Nevertheless, as I stated, the instructor pulled me aside, wanted to demonstrate to the rest in the group this particular sidekick technique, and in doing so, he asked for me to remain perfectly still, which I did. He began his pro approach, and the next thing I knew, I was getting up off of the floor with stars kind of going around in my eyes, and the instructor, he missed. <laughs> he actually hit me square in the jaw and knocked me out for a couple of seconds. You can imagine this. Of course, he was apologetic and embarrassed, and he assured the class that this would never, ever happen again, and it's never happened before. I was just the lucky guy who got to enjoy it this particular time. And I can assure you, it gave me new meaning to the phrase, no pain, no gain. <laughs> Nevertheless, this, this idea, this theory for people who who operate out of experience and wisdom reveals many truths about the reality of our journey. They know intuitively, at least, whether physically or emotionally, that real measurable gain in this journey is usually accomplished and accompanied by some dedicated effort that often ushers in discomfort. Pain. Spiritually speaking, as Jesus taught his closest friends and followers, this concept of discipleship, it included the full range of life experience in this world, from triumph to tragedy, from heartbreak to joy, which is why today's gospel story explains, in a sense, the interaction as Jesus sets forth his steps to Jerusalem and comes across some folks who appear to be ready recruits to join the team, to get ready to go. Now, in full context, we must, we must remember that just in, in chapter 9, Jesus is healing people, wonderful miracles are occurring, people are seeing the, the power of his ministry, and who wouldn't want to be a part of that? But as he comes to this moment in the gospel, his cause, it seems to be, is to put a little distance between those who are raising their hands and saying, hey, I'm ready to go, and those who might think about it. Jesus, Jesus as I said, made a conscious decision now to move to Jerusalem. And as these folks came up, one person said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me bury my father. And then still another person said, I will follow you, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus' response to all of these requests were portentous. Using a familiar analogy that many of the farmers around him and uh, uh, of, of that area would understand, Jesus says, no one puts his hand on the plow and looks back. No one who does that is fit for service in the kingdom of God. What was Jesus trying to connect 
to these apparently new enthusiastic recruits that wanted to follow him. What does it mean to put your hand to the plow? What does it mean to take your hand off of the plow? What is that person? Who is that person? Why is that person not fit for the kingdom of God? As noted in the beginning of this exchange, in response to the first person that said, I will, he draws the image that the consequences, consequences of such a decision means that there will be no home moving forward, at least in this life, no real home moving forward. There will be no place to retreat to. The foxes have holes and the birds have nests, but if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to get used to living on the road. No place to go home. Likewise, related to that first question, we must remember that Jesus often referred to in his teachings the concept of the earth and ground. And when a farmer got ready to plant seeds, they would turn the ground. They would plow, and, and, and the, the deeper the better. The more they could break up the, the dirt, uh, the, the more that the plant, once it started to sprout, could grow deep roots. Could it be a metaphor for turning the world upside down as a, as a farmer would plow and turn the soil upside down? What would it mean to take your hand off of a plow once you put it on? Well, if you've ever done any tilling in a garden, you know that a good gardener, in this case we could even make it applicable to a farmer with his tractor, always looks straight ahead. Always. They never look back. Why? Because the moment you look back, your straight row <laughs> starts to go one direction or another. Just think about it when you're driving down the road in your car. And if something gets your attention and you kind of look off the center of the road, how easy does it take your car to drift from either the left side or the right side? And you look up and you go, wow, that just happened in a second. That's exactly what Jesus was talking about. If you take your hand off of the plow, then the row isn't straight. And that has all kinds of complications for a farmer. They have a certain amount of space between each row that they have to get into and cultivate to have a good garden, to have a garden that produces a bountiful fruit. So to have crooked rows would be a tragedy, would be uh, a terrible thing to try to overcome. So what was Jesus trying to say? If they truly, really understood, if they wanted to follow him, they must be single-minded in their focus. They must be single-minded in their, in their purpose and their mission. And all of the distractions that may come along the way, they would have to resist if they really wanted to be effective. They must be ready to kind of plow that straight line. Therefore, Jesus relates the, the commitment to a cost. And we've hear, we hear this throughout the Gospels about how following Jesus ushers in a cost. The first cost we already mentioned is this idea that there's no longer security with a place to go home. We give that up when we follow Jesus. The disciple will be no more secure than the teacher. If the teacher, which Jesus says, has no place to lay his head, neither will the disciple. The next thing that Jesus says is discipleship demands a singular commitment to the kingdom of God. A true disciple must be willing to let the spiritually dead bury the physically dead. 
we must be able, they must be able to follow life and to follow it everlasting. And finally, discipleship, the kind of following that Jesus was interested in, never looks back and reconsiders. It never operates by a delayed response. It means taking hold of the commission given by Christ and moving forward. Currently, I am involved in doing some wedding counseling for two folks who are going to be getting married at the end of July. And every time I start down that road, we end up talking about the idea of Christian marriage and really how different that idea is from secular understanding of marriage. We talk about the big C, the commitment piece. And that's a very, very uh, challenging part of being married. For most of you here, if you're married and you've been married for any length of time, you know they can be difficult times. Times when it would be easy to look back and reevaluate and go, hmm, not sure. But the idea of Christian marriage begins with this uh, solid commitment. A commitment that understands that there may be richer or poor. There may be good health or bad health. There may be times when I just do not want to do this anymore, but somehow we have to remain focused. Someone once said that a successful marriage is two people who are really good at forgiving. That's probably true. Two people who are really good at forgiving. However, as we think about this kind of uh, high level of discipleship, this high level of following Christ, as in other places in the gospel, they attest that to do this requires a change. It requires a change in all of us. And it's not simply an external change. It has to take place deep inside one soul. It has to take place in people's hearts. And Jesus, I think, the reason why when at the zenith of his popularity and the crowds came and he probably could have had, you know, anybody he wanted to follow him, the reason why he pushed them away and said, think about what you're getting ready to do, think about the cost of following me, is he knew how easy it is to kind of get on the program externally. But what a different mindset it takes and a heart to claim it eternally and internally. That's what real change does. Change takes us out of our comfort zone. It doesn't allow us to relax, and it doesn't give us the assurance in life that we long for. We begin to, to, to live in risk, and that's a challenging place to be. But I think that we, we have to remember in this whole idea of following Jesus, that he never asked his disciples to worship him. Think about it for a moment. He never really asked his followers to worship him. What he asked them to do was what? Follow him. That's a big difference. In our churches, especially in the institutional church today, in the worship wars of the 80s and the 90s and the early 2000s, what did we do? We got in all these disagreements and arguments about how to worship him, right? We were, 
oh, we, we're not going to have a drum set in this sanctuary, or we don't like that kind of music, or we don't want to do this, or we don't want to do that. It was all about that, that hour of worship, when in fact Jesus is saying to his disciples, no, it's about following me. You see, this hour that we spend together, anybody can do this. It's easy to put on a coat and a tie and come here on Sunday for an hour. It's easy to kind of go through those motions for an hour. No, the real challenge for people who want to follow Christ is, is what happens after this hour. Are we affected in some way? When we are affected, when our lives begin to change, when we decide to kind of get on that path and put our hand to that plow and keep our eyes straight ahead and quit looking at the distractions, then something miraculous begins to happen in our lives. We start to find meaning and purpose in places we never thought existed. Meaning and purpose changes how we measure things. We no longer worry about, well, is the sanctuary full, or uh, what can we do to get more people here, or all those kinds of things. What we do is, when we have a, a vacation Bible school like we just had, and we have... 15 kids, instead of thinking back 30 years ago, well, gosh, we used to have 100 kids here. What happened? That thought process changes and says, we've got 15 kids here. That's a miracle. In this world today that we had 15 kids here today, when they could have been on the soccer field or the baseball field or the ballet class or the swim lessons or all the other things that children can do, all the other activities, it's a miracle. It's a miracle. And that's what this kind of change of following, of digging deep, allowing Christ to have the center part of our hearts and our minds, that's what happens if we are willing to risk it. And it is a risk. Because the moment that we truly step in behind the Lord and follow him, things change around us too. Friends change. <laughs> we look different, we act different, and we talk different. And people see that. But it's a commitment. It's a commitment. Now, like is so often the case, you're probably thinking, Pastor Chris, why do you keep preaching to the choir? We're here. We're doing it, man. We're here. And you are here, and that's great. But there is tremendous amount of work to be done. There always is. As long as we take um, breath in our lungs, that row is not finished. We still have plowing to do. And if we set our hands to that plow and we don't take them off, God's blessing and his peace, his miracles, a sense that we have value in our life. Isn't, isn't that really at the end of the day what we want? Don't we want to, to go to our deaths thinking that, that our, our life meant something? That we just were not here in a, a vapor of uh, uh, 50 or 60 or 70 years, and when we're gone, it's just done, and, and, and nobody, there's no impact at all. Isn't it, isn't it a, 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 a 
novel, noble idea to think that my life meant something. It meant something to other people. It had an impact on someone. It maybe affected a child who needed help. It maybe helped a, a couple who was thinking about a divorce. Maybe it helped someone who was losing their job. That my life had value and meaning. And that is the reward for putting your hands on the plow and not taking them off is our lives have value. So, we're always in this time of worship, this hour of worship, we're always faced with that question. Do we want to allow God to have his way with us? Do we, do we want to commit? And sometimes, again, brothers and sisters, that commitment happens right where we are today. We don't have to leave something to go find something. It can happen right where we are today. There's a story, and I, I, I can't remember. I'd like to give it the proper credit, but I can't remember the author. But he tells a story of a young man who went to work in a hardware store. And the owner of the hardware store, you know, typical old-timey hardware stores with stuff everywhere, right? And this young man... Uh, asked the, the owner of the hardware store if he could take some of this stuff that was just cluttering up everything and like make a table and, and sell it cheap, like for maybe a nickel or a dime. And the owner finally relinquished and said, yeah, you can do that. So he did that, and that weekend the whole table sold out. So he did it again. And he took the stuff that was just laying around and he put a nickel or a dime on it, he put it on the table, and it sold out again. So he tried to convince the owner of the hardware store, this is, there's something important here, we need to try to do this. And the owner of the hardware store would not relinquish, would not give an inch, said, no, we're not going to change our model, we're not going to change anything. That young man went to become Woolworths the Five and Dime Company. And the owner of that hardware store, in recalling that moment in their existence, said that every word that he used to try to talk this young man out of doing that cost him a million dollars. The time is now. We are his children. And he's called us to grab a hold of something bigger than all of us combined. Stay committed, stay focused, and God will supply the return. And we will sense true purpose and meaning in our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Our final hymn today is found on page 535, Joining Our Voices. If you are able, let us stand and sing.
Again, thanks to all who helped Vacation Bible School be such a wonderful success, all the people who volunteered and the, the young folks that were taking a part of that. We can rejoice in that today. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his counts upon you and give you peace in the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you.